called Solomon and his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house in my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. You will recall that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, they received the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and also the instructions and the pattern that God set forth for the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent-like structure, which, since they were going to be traveling around, they could take up and or take down and put up as the need arose. Now then, though, they had come into, and after 40 years of wilderness wanderings, Joshua leads them into the land of Israel, that promised land. And they take that land. They are at the end because of sin within uh, the lives of the Israelites. They go into bondage several different times, and uh, when they realize their wickedness and their sin, they cry unto God, and God sends them to them a deliverer, a judge, to deliver them out of the hand of the, of the oppressor. This, there are 15 judges that we find, and then at, as we come to that last judge, Samuel, the people started crying for a king to reign over them, to be like the nations round about them. And so God in his anger gave them a king, gave them Saul, the son of Sis. After Saul sinned, and his, as we would see in 1 Samuel the 15th chapter, his trying to pass the buck of his sin to others, uh, basically the people made me do it, uh, type of attitude. God removed Saul from being king, and he set up David to be their king. David was a man of war, though. There were battles on every side, on a regular basis. And so he has stated here, shed much blood. But he had an interest in the house of God, for here's this tabernacle, this tent-like structure that was the dwelling place of God. And David thought within himself, here I am in a castle, in a home, permanent structure. Here we are within Israel in the land of promise. It's not right that the house of God, that temple or the tabernacle, should that God should dwell in a tent-like structure like the tabernacle. I'll build a house for him. At first, he's told, yes, go ahead and do it. But then he's told by the prophet, no, because you're a man of war and you've shed much blood, you're not going to be allowed to. And so we come to this aspect that now at the end of his life, David calls in his son Solomon, who's now going to be king, and charge Solomon and his son, you build the house that I wanted to build. Later on in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, verse 18, Solomon is now recounting this and says that the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in my heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. God praised David's thought, even though he did not allow David to build the tabernacle or that temple. God says, you're doing well. That thought was a good thought. Your heart is in a right direction. Your affections are set on things that should be set on. Even though he was not allowed to build the house. Yet, even though he was not allowed to build it, he took a great interest in it. 
And we start reading in 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter. And in verses 9 through verse 12, it says, And now Solomon, my son, this is David again, he is giving a charge to his son Solomon, who's going to be king. Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Father, for the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the uh, place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries of the dedicated things. <coughs> Notice in this charge to his son Solomon, Beautiful charge here. Know God, thy Father. I, we certainly need to know God today. Serve Him with perfect heart. Now we need to serve Him. We'll mention that a little bit more in a moment. But uh, with perfect heart, with a will in mind. And if you seek Him, He'll be found of you. But if you forsake Him, He's going to cast you off. In other words, if you follow after His will, if you seek Him, if you do what He wants, there's going to be that relationship between you and God. However, if you forsake Him, He'll destroy you. Your kingdom will not stand. But now then, He gets to this aspect. Here's this house that I want to build. Take heed now. The Lord's chosen you to do it. He didn't allow me to do it. I wanted to. God said no, because I'm a man of war. But now that He's chosen you to do it, be strong and do it. David had a great interest in the fact that the house of the Lord was going to be built. He did not feel right. I say feel from the standpoint he knew it was not right for it them to be dwelling in houses and here is the temple of God in a tent-like tent structure. And so he had that great interest that it be done. And even though he's not allowed to, he, he's charging his son Saul, you make sure you do it. There's an interest that is seen there. But also, he had an interest that it be done according to the pattern. So many today don't believe that there is any pattern. They ignore any pattern that's found within God's Word. But David recognized there's a pattern that's been given. Also in that which we read just a moment ago, 1 Chronicles 28, we started in verse 9 to see that charge that David gave, but in verses 11 and verse 12, it sets forth that here's the pattern that David gave to Solomon and his son. The pattern of the porch, of the houses thereof, of the treasuries thereof, of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of God, and of all the chambers round about, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries of the dedicated thing. I believe that when it says in verse 12, the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, I think that's not, and I think that S there should be capitalized because I think it's talking about the Holy Spirit there. And recognize that in the text, the, the original text, that there were no basically caps in the lower letters. And so it, it is dependent upon the context 
the translators of the King James here translated this with a small s, thinking it's more the human spirit. But I think it's dealing with the Holy Spirit. That God had given him this power. And in fact, a few verses later, we see that very thing. Verse Chronicles 28, verse 19 and 20. All this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by His hand upon me. Even all the works of this pattern. And David said to Solomon his, strong, his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. God made David understand this pattern. What is it? There is a pattern. David was interested in you make sure you build this according to the pattern. Why? Because God has set forth a pattern. God has set forth a pattern in relationship to the church today. And we need to have a respect for that pattern that God has given as well. Even as David had a respect for that pattern. But we also need to have an interest in the house of God today. Even as David had an interest in the house of God. And so David collected a great amount of materials. Precious items. Because he had that interest in the house of God. And he collected all of these things so that his son Solomon will have them available to build the house of God. In 1 Kings, the 6th chapter, we see, in, especially in verse 17, but the entire chapter really deals with the idea that the house of God that, Paul, uh, that David is referring to, that Solomon was to build, is the temple. Notice in verse 17 that the house... That is the temple before it was, and then he starts describing the, that temple or the house. So the house is that temple that was before it. The house of God today is the church. First Timothy five, uh, 3 and verse 15. Paul says, But if I tear along that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of truth. That church of God is also spoken of as God's temple. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 and verse 17, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The ye there is the church of God. The church specifically at Corinth that he's dealing with, but in a general sense and thus applicable to all congregation. The church is God's temple. It is God's house. With that as an understanding, we need to understand a little bit about the significance of the temple and the house that we see in the Old Testament. And if you go back into the Old Testament, you start looking at that, that temple, that house, was first a place of worship to God. The people would come there for their worship. And thus, it was a place of worship to God. But it was also a place of service to God. And so here they would come, and the Levites in particular would serve God in relationship to that aspect. And so when we say that David had an interest in the house of God, we're saying, first off, that David had an interest in worship and a worship to God. In Psalm 9 and verse 1, it says, and I will praise thee, O God, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. The idea of I will praise thee, O Lord. That's the idea of worshiping God. In our worship, and the idea of worship, uh, our English word, comes from a word which deals with worth, something that is of worth, of value. 
The Greek word of worship deals with the idea of to kiss toward. That we are giving honor and homage, we are praising one who is superior to us. As David expresses here, I will praise thee for all of thy marvelous works. We recognize the greatness of God, His greatness, and thus we praise Him. We worship Him. And in the 122nd Psalm, in verse 1, David states that, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. I wonder how many of us can really echo the statement of David here. I was glad when they said, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Or is it more of an attitude, Well, I'm getting tired and we got to go again. When we have to beg people to be here on Sunday evening or for Bible class on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening? Is there really that attitude within their heart? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God or of the Lord. Or is it that attitude of, well, I'd rather not, but I know I've got to. We have our gospel meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. Are we going to have that attitude? I was glad that we are having this gospel meeting so that I can go and worship God. Or is it we will make plans that will interfere or allow other things to interfere with our coming together to worship Him? What's our attitude? David had an interest, yes, in the house of God. He had an interest in worshiping God. I was glad that also David had an interest in servants to God. In 1 Chronicles, the 23rd chapter, verse 23, or verse 25 through verse 28, it says that David said, The Lord God of Israel hath given rest unto his people, that they may dwell in Jerusalem forever, and also unto the Levites. They shall no more carry the tabernacle, nor any, ves any vessels of it, for the service thereof. For by the last words of David, the Levites were numbered from twenty years old and above, because their office was to wait on the sons of Aaron for the service of the house of the Lord, in the courts and in the chambers, and in the purifying of all holy things, and the work of the service in the house of God. And in verse 32, he adds, And that they should keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the charge of the holy place, and the charge of the sons of Aaron, their brethren, in the service of the house of the Lord. To understand a little bit about this, the tribe of Levi was that tribe that was given was the priestly tribe. But there were three families of the tribe of Levites. One of them, the that group that Aaron came from, were the priests. And they were the ones who did the service and the high priest, of course, going into that most holy place, or, I mean offering the sacrifices. The high priest on the Day of Atonement going into the most holy place to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people and for his own sin. But then there's two other families of the Levites. Those families dealt more with the service that was related to the work of the priest. And now then David is saying, we, we're building this permanent place. Here's this place in which the temple is going to reside. It's no longer going to be taken down and set up. And so a lot of the work which they are, were given to do, that's over with. And so now then we're going to give you this area of work, this service. We want you to serve in this area. David was interested in service in the house of God. Again, in 2 Chronicles 8 and verse 14, he appointed, according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service, 
and the Levites to their, their charges to praise and minister before the priests as the duty of every day required. The porters also by their courses at every gate. For so David the man of God commanded. You see, there is David, and now that Solomon is setting up these appointments that David had made. The courses of the priests for their service, and also the Levites in the work that they were going to be doing. And their duty that took place every day. David is the one who had set that up in relationship to the house of God. Why? Because he was interested in the service of God. Why? Because he had an interest in the house of God. But our interest needs to be in the house of God as well. The church of God. And in that, it, just as David was interested in worship, our interest should be in worship. John would write that Jesus stated that the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This, of course, coming upon the question of this Samaritan woman. Where is the proper place of worship? You Jews say that Jerusalem is the place of worship. We Samaritans say that Mount Gerizim is the place of worship. Which one is right? Well, the time is coming when the place of worship is going to matter. But God seeks worshipers. Those worshipers need to be true worshipers. To be true worshipers, you have to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But the Father is seeking worshipers. We need to have an interest in worship in relationship to God. That we are going to worship Him. In Revelation, the 14th chapter. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We need to have that attitude. I have that desire. And as David said, I was glad when they said unto me, Let's go worship. How is our attitude about that worship? Is it that attitude of I've got to, I, or just a drudge? It doesn't make us have joy within our hearts that we can come before God and come together and sing these songs of praise to God, to pray to our Heavenly Father and take our petitions before His throne of grace, to remember our Lord's death, the sacrifice that He made for us, to, yes, give of our means into that common treasury for the church to use that money to further the cause of Christ and to study God's work. Do we have an interest in that? Do we say, oh boy, let's have some more. I'm glad do we come to have that worship Him and worshipful attitude of God that one that made heaven, earth, sea, and fountains of the water. In the 19th chapter of Revelation, John falls at the feet of an angel, says to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Worship God. God has created within man a need to worship. We are worshipful beings. Every one who lives has that need within him. We have to make sure that we direct that worshipful attitude that we have to the proper source. 
John was directing it at the wrong source here, and he's corrected. Don't worship me. Worship God. We need to have that same attitude of worship God. But also we need to have an attitude of service. David had that interest in the service relating to the temple. We need to have an attitude of service in relationship to the church of our Lord. In Romans 12th chapter, and in verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now you're taking a minute here. Hey, some of the newer translations come along. And they have translated this last phrase, which is your reasonable service. Unto, which is your spiritual worship. And they translate the term that is King James translates as service as worship. It's the Greek word of true. And if you go into the book of Hebrews and you study carefully the word that as is used here, you will see that it's not really dealing with worship itself. It was dealing with the priest and what we were talking about earlier in relationship to David. There were those priests, the high priests, who would offer the sacrifices. But then there were the Levites who served in relationship to that worship. That's the word that is I use of Latruo, the service that was done in relationship to the worship. It was not the worship, but it was the service related to it. That's the word that Paul uses here, which is your reasonable service. There's going to be service to do in relationship to God's work and God's dealing, the church of our Lord. Sometimes we, because of our terminology, and it's not wrong terminology necessarily, but sometimes it leaves an improper attitude or aspect that the idea of service is, well, those people who serve at the Lord's table or those people who serve by leading prayers, and well, there is an aspect of service in those areas. No doubt about it. But if our idea of service in relationship to the church is limited to that, then we've got a wrong attitude of service. Our service is going to include many things. It's going to include the doing of good works to others. It's going to include, yes, handing out brochures and to invite people and inviting people and even bringing them to our gospel meeting or during our lectureship. It's going out and teaching the gospel to others. It embraces numerous aspects that we are to do in service unto God. We need to be interested in those things. We need to be involved in it. If we have an interest in the church, the house of God, we're going to be involved in those things. The problem is that we think today so many times that well, as long as I'm here Sunday morning, I've got my ticket punched to heaven. No, I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Because I was here Sunday morning. Why? That's all that's necessary, you know. And I partook of the Lord's Supper. That's all that's needed. Some think, well, as long as I, you know, here for the Lord's Supper, I can leave for the rest of it. I don't know. We don't really need the singing and the sermon and all of these other things. I was here for the Lord's Supper. I've got my way to heaven now. No, there's service to be involved. Just being here is our at attitude of worship. And as has been placed on many a building, as you come into the building, there's a sign that says, Enter to worship 
And as you go, there's a sign that says, leave to serve. And there's a true aspect of that. When we leave this building, we need to go out into the world to serve in relationship to the church. That good work that I do, do I do it and I associate the Lord's church with that? And do they associate the Lord's church with it? Or is it that, well, that, you know, he's a friendly person. He did this, or he's a good person. And there's nothing in relationship to the church. Our attitude has to be service in relationship to the church of our Lord. The church in Thyatira, Revelation 2 and verse 19. Jesus says to them, I know thy works and thy charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Jesus says, I know the service that you give to the church, to the house of God. We need to have that type of an interest. Yes, in worshiping our God, but also in serving Him. That's really what Jesus speaks about in Matthew 6, 33, when He says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Put the kingdom, that's the church, first in your life. His righteousness. That has to be at the priority within your life. Worship and service. An interest in the house of the Lord. The song we sang this morning, and I didn't ask Paul to lead this, but he led it. I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode. The church, our blessed Redeemer, saved with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand. Dear as the apple of thine eye, graven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall. For her my prayers ascend. To her my cares and toils be given, till toils and cares shall end. Beyond my highest joy, I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Jesus, thou friend divine, our Savior and our King, thy hand from every snare and foe shall great deliverance bring. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given. The brightest glory as earth can yield, and brighter bliss of heaven. Only when we have a true interest in the church of our Lord and love the kingdom of God will we be acceptable and, we will, and will we have that brighter bliss of heaven available to us. If you're not a Christian this morning, then become such by your faith, repenting of your sins, making the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And then, yes, have that love for the church of our Lord, that precious blood, body of Christ, that precious entity which Christ died and shed his blood on Calvary's cross for. And live in such a way that you're serving well that each and every day. If there's sin within your life as a child of God, you need to repent of that sin and come back into Him to faithfulness to Him. And why not do that this morning as we stand and sing the invitation song?